All right, this is diastole part two. It's actually going to be broken up into two uh, different parts. We're going to start with actually just looking at diastole in the ICU, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to grade it like a pro. So identifying diastolic dysfunction in the ICU is actually very simple. If you remember from the last lecture, there is one marker that we can always start with because that's our most sensitive and specific marker of diastolic dysfunction, and that is our E prime velocity, right? So let's just start by looking at E prime. Frankly, I'm almost always starting with my lateral E prime because A, the number 10 is a lot easier for me to remember than seven. And B, because a lot of patients in the ICU, at least the patients I manage, have some degree of right ventricular dysfunction as well. They're on a ventilator, they're hypoxemic, they have pulmon underlying pulmonary hypertension for whatever reason. So their septum sometimes can behave funny, especially if they're volume overloaded. So my septal E prime velocity is a little bit less reliable there when my RV is really under stress. So I will use my lateral E prime velocity a lot more than my septum. But you can measure both, and you probably should. So first thing to do is just look at your E prime. If it's low, the magnitude is low, you definitely have diastolic dysfunction. So then the next thing to do is just look at your E and your A velocities, your pulse wave Doppler, your mitral inflow velocities, and compare your E to E prime. We talked about in the first lecture that E to E prime is reflective of left atrial pressure. So if I have an average E to E prime that's greater than 14 or lateral that's greater than 12 to 13, I have increased left atrial pressure. So if I have both of these things present, a low E prime velocity and a high E to E prime, then I am definitely, I'll say likely, but almost definitely dealing with diastolic dysfunction with increased left atrial pressure. And all I'll do at this point now is seek a little bit of secondary evidence that will help me convince myself that's the case. So if, it, if I'm wondering if it's chronic, I'll look and see if there's an enlarged left atrium. That'll help. I can even do that qualitatively, right? I can look for secondary pulmonary hypertension, so I can look at my TR jet velocity. If that's high, that would help make the case for diastolic dysfunction. If I have a very high E to A ratio, you only get this really when you have diastolic dysfunction, E to A greater than or equal to two. And then of course, I'm gonna be thinking about underlying risk factors. Both chronic risk factors for HFPEF, things like AFib, diabetes, coronary disease, LVH, but also thinking about acute things that cause acute diastolic dysfunction, such as septic cardiomyopathy, often a diastolic failure at first. So. Um, all of it's going to be put in context, of course, but these are really only two things to look at in the ICU. So again, if I want to ballpark left atrial pressure in the ICU, and to me this is the most critical question to answer with my echo probe when I'm doing diastology, I'm going to start by measuring my E, my A, and my E prime. And if my E to E prime is high, if my E to A is greater than or equal to 2, this is anecdotal, but if my E is greater than 150 centimeters per second, I have to be dealing with a really high left atrial pressure. It's hard to get that from the pull function alone. Sorry, the baby's making a little noise as I'm lecturing. E to E prime, anything over 13 to 14 is making me think that there's significant left atrial hypertension because this formula here actually can approximate left atrial pressure. E to E prime plus four. I can also look at some of my advanced metrics like the deceleration time. Um, if I really wanted to know if there's significant diastolic dysfunction. And of course, if I have left ventricular systolic dysfunction and any of the above, then I'm almost certainly dealing with diastolic dysfunction because you can't have severe systolic dysfunction and not have some degree of diastolic dysfunction. Okay, so let's go through a case here. What is the most likely explanation for the, these values in an ICU patient with normal sinus rhythm? So I have an E velocity of 62.7, an A velocity of 79.4, and a lateral E prime velocity of 7.6. Now you notice this is slightly, slightly off axis, probably measured by a fellow, not me, <laughs> of course. Uh, so, you know, it's slightly off axis. It would have been a little bit better to line this, this uh, sample box up a little better, but E prime is probably less than 10. So is this normal diastolic function, abnormal diastolic function with a normal left atrial pressure, abnormal diastolic function with increased left atrial pressure, or not enough information? Do, do, do. Yep, it's abnormal diastolic function with a normal left atrial pressure. So I know that because I have an E prime that's below 10, a lateral E prime that's below 10, but my E to E prime ratio is going to be well below 10. So that's going to tell me left atrial pressure is normal. So this would be called grade one diastolic dysfunction if you want to grade like a pro. And that's exactly what we're going to do next. So this is diastology by the book. Um, and we're going to do it like a pro, at least a semi-pro. Even if you're not a cardiologist, you can understand how they grade diastolic dysfunction. And this comes to be helpful if you decide you don't want to be doing your own echoes and you order an echo, and they tell you this stuff in the bottom of the report. Um, it helps you understand what you're really dealing with. So this is grade one physiology. You have abnormally slow prolonged relaxation, so the pull force is diminishing, but I have normal left atrial pressure. 
And that's all I'll say there. So how is that going to manifest? Well, because left atrial pressure is still normal, my E velocity will be pretty normal. However, because there is impaired relaxation, when I do my tissue dopplering of my myocardium, I'm going to have a reduced E prime velocity. I have to have that. That is essential for diastolic dysfunction. When I do to my E to E prime, it's going to be low 14. That's going to tell me that my left atrial pressure is normal. Again, that is a prerequisite for grade one diastolic dysfunction. And I'm going to probably have a normal TR jet velocity. In other words, I'm not going to have left atrial hypertension, so I'm probably not going to have secondary pulmonary hypertension. Remember, your TR jet velocity is a reflection of your right ventricular systolic pressure, which is approximately your PA systolic pressure. So I would expect my E velocity to be somewhere around 50, but my, I'm going to get a little bit of reversal here. So what I would expect to see in grade one is that E is going to slow down because my pull function is diminished. My push isn't very strong yet either because my left atrial pressure is still normal, but my atrial kick is going to become increasingly important. So this is another marker of grade one diastolic dysfunction that my E to A ratio is less than 0.8. My atrial kick needs to compensate for this drop in my E velocity. The other things you're going to see if you really want to do it like a pro is your deceleration time is going to lengthen. Um, and that's because the left ventricular relaxation is slowing down. And same with my ice, uh, my isovolumic relaxation time, that's also going to lengthen. Other things I can look for here in grade one is abnormally high e velocities. Um, so even if it's a high e velocity, if my e to a ratio is low, that means I'm still dealing probably with grade one diastolic dysfunction as well, as long as my e to e prime is still normal. Um, and we've already said this other stuff. TR velocity will be normal uh, or not significantly elevated, and left atrial size and volume should not be significantly elevated in grade one diastolic dysfunction. And again, we already talked a little bit about um, the early filling. So it's going to elongate because I'm going to have slower left ventricular relaxation, and a but I have normal left atrial pressure. Uh, that looks like a duplicate side. So grade two diastolic dysfunction is what's called pseudonormal. So now my E to A ratio comes back to normal. Remember before, it was reversed. I had E to A reversal, so my A has to become more uh, forceful. In grade two, it's pseudo-normalizes. So now my E comes back to be normal, but that's not because my suction or my pull effect is, is back in play. It's because I now have a high left atrial pressure state. So that E velocity is going to be high again simply because I have high left atrial pressure. So again, we keep talking about E to E prime. It's going to be high here because it's a marker of left atrial pressure. My E velocity is going to go back up. And I'm going to have other signs now in grade 2 diastolic dysfunction of chronically elevated left atrial pressure. And you can induce, uh, deduce what those are going to be. They're going to be things like a left atrial volume that's increased or secondary pulmonary hypertension with a high TR jet velocity. So when we look at the physiology here, I'm going to have more push than pull. So I'm going to have decent push because I have a high left atrial pressure, but I'm going to have a weak pull. But because my push is hard, my E velocity is high. So I still have a lot of early diastolic filling. My high left atrial pressure does not limit the contribution of my atrial kick at this point. So I'm going to have a normal A velocity. Now because my left ventricular, uh, my left ventricle is relaxing poorly and it's stiffening, my deceleration time at this point um, and my isovolumic relaxation time become low normal because now my left atrial pressure is high, so that actually ends up causing these two things to shorten. The mitral valve pops open earlier because left atrial pressure is high, that's going to shorten my isovolumic relaxation time. And my left ventricle is stiff and is not going to be able to accommodate blood very much, so there's going to be a rapid peak to the, the, the maximal velocity, and it's going to rapidly slow down. The deceleration time is going to be short. Does that make sense? So I have a stiff ventricle. Big gush of blood is going to come in, but it's going to rapidly slow down because there's not much room for it to move in there. Uh, there's nowhere for it to go. So my E to A's here are going to be between 0.8 and 2. Once I get above 2, I'm now starting to talk about grade 3. Or I may have a, uh, E to A that's less than 0.8, but with a high E velocity and a high E to E prime ratio. All that's to say, just let, recognize that if you have a high E to E prime and the, and uh, a low E prime, sorry, if you have a high E to E prime and a low E prime velocity, you're probably dealing with grade two diastolic dysfunction as long as your E to A is under two. All right, this is pseudo normalized. So uh, one cool thing you could do, this is physiology. We don't do this in the ICU very often, although you could if you wanted to do a big breath hold or something, is if you do a Valsalva for 10 seconds, and this is a true Valsalva, 10 seconds of intrathoracic pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury, you can take this pseudo-normalized ratio and make it grade one diastolic dysfunction again. So right here I have grade two, I have an E to A ratio greater than uh, 0.8. Um, I have a high E velocity, 
But if I have my patient Valsalva, I'm going to decrease left atrial pressure, decrease preload. Um, so now my E to A is going to go back to this grade one type physiology where my A, a velocity becomes the predominant uh, uh, velocity through the mitral valve. So a drop of an E to A ratio by 50% is co uh, confirmed pseudonormalization, uh, which would also confirm that I have high life with atrial pressure because you're only going to get this degree of an E to A change if you actually have left atrial pressure uh, elevation to begin with. Okay, let's talk about grade three and grade four. These are pretty simple. In grade three and grade four, we have a very high left atrial pressure and we have what's called restricted filling. And it can be reversible with a Valsalva in grade three, but if you can't reverse it, that's called fixed restrictive, that's um, grade four. So when I'm talking about grade three, grade four, I'm still gonna have all of the same stuff I always had before. A high E to E prime velocity, a low E prime velocity, secondary pulmonary hypertension with a high TR jet velocity, and a large left atrium. My E to A here, this is the defining feature of restricted filling is that it's the E to A is going to be greater than 2. So I'm going to have these huge E waves and a very small A wave. My isovolumic relaxation time at this point, it becomes very short. Um, and so does my deceleration time because left atrial pressure is very high. So my mitral valve will pop, an open, pop open very early in diastole. And then my um, velocity will abruptly terminate, or at least the peak will rapidly drop off because the left ventricle is not able to accommodate much blood. Big gush comes in, rapidly, uh, rapid, rapid equalization of pressures between left atrium and the very elevated left ventricular end diastolic pressure, or left ventricular pressure, and uh, now this this peak looks like this, a really sharp peak rapidly dropping off. So at this point now, my E is almost dictated all by my strong push function, a high left atrial pressure, and not at all by my pull force. In fact, there's almost no pull force here anymore. And in grade three and grade four diastolic dysfunction, my high left atrial pressure actually limits contribution of the atrial kick um, because now my left atrial pressure is quite high. So is my left ventricular diastolic pressure. We're starting to get towards end diastolic pressure. So that's also going to limit the volume that I can produce, uh, that I can push into the left ventricle. So A drops off significantly because there's very high left, entric left ventricular end diastolic pressure as well. So again, if I have someone Valsalva, Grade three, I can make uh, not be restricted anymore. Uh, grade four, even if they Valsalva, they're still stuck with this E to A ratio greater than two. So that's called reversible restrictive and fixed restrictive. Okay, so here's a question, making sure that I've explained this in some way that makes sense. What grade of diastolic dysfunction is most likely present in this ICU patient with respiratory failure? Now, I've only measured one thing. I probably jumped ahead here. I only measured one thing. I measured a lateral E prime velocity. This is measured nicely, right? I've got my uh, sample box right over the myocardium, right at the mitral valve annulus in the uh, infralateral wall. I guess it's just a lateral wall. It's a four chain review. So uh, anyways, this is normal, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. Yeah, it's normal, right? I have an E prime velocity that is well above 13. So that is a normal, that is a vigorously, vigorously relaxing left ventricle. 